there is a worldly saying curiosity kill the cat and uh, it could be probably the cat was very curious to know what the dog was doing in the kennel and must have gone and peeped and got bitten by the dog and got killed sometimes human beings also do that and get into trouble and curiosity in itself is not bad but there can be good curiosity and that can be there can be bad curiosity good curiosity sometimes led people in the past to invent so many things and discover so many things and they became a blessing and the fruit of which we enjoy today for instance telephone graham bell was the one who invented it and because of that we enjoy it today and uh, the electric light thomas alva edison he failed in so many experiments but still finally he succeeded and he, because of his invention we are enjoying the light today even in darkness and like that there are so many inventions and discoveries newton discovered isaac newton the law of gravity when an apple fell down from the tree these these were all good curiosities and uh, they have blessed us and there are bad curiosities also which have put people into trouble and because of which they have lost their testimony or lost their lives or their families like that so we can look up today at some good curiosities and some bad curiosities from the bible you turn with me to genesis chapter 15 god had told umpteen times to abraham that he was going to bless him and make him a blessing and that he shall be in him all the nations of the earth will be blessed as if that was not enough god again spoke to me in verse 15 after these things chapter 15 verse 1 after these things the word of the lord came to abraham in a vision saying do not fear abraham i am a shield to you your reward shall be great you see previously in chapter 12 god had told to abraham you go forth from your city verse 2 i will make you a great nation and i'll bless you and your name will be great and you shall be a blessing and last part of the uh, verse 3 is and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed god had already given this promise to abraham in you all the families of the earth will be blessed and again when god told him about this he asks god lord what will you give me it's like a child asking his father uh, when the father gives some magnificent promises to him i'll give you this i'll give you that and then he asks lord verse 2 and abraham said oh lord what will you give me this was some kind of curiosity and you know thereafter also god told him a few more times that i will bless you i'll give you a son i'll give you a son through your body and through his body he got ishmael but he thought that was it god said no through your body and through sarah's body i will give you a promised seed and that was isaac and that's how god fulfilled his promise and then we read in exodus chapter 3 there is another incident where Exodus 3 verse 2 it says and the angel of the lord appeared to moses in a blazing fire from the midst of a burning bush 
And he looked and behold, the bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. So Moses said, I must turn aside now and see this marvelous sight. Why the bush is not being burnt up? This was another curiosity. He was observing that fire, a bush was on fire, but it was not being consumed. And then he became curious and went near that and saw why this is not being consumed by fire, even though it is burning. And then God gives him a call, a tremendous call, a mission, a commission to lead the people of Israel out of the land of Egypt to the promised land. This was another incidence of curiosity. And then we read in 1 Samuel 17, 1 Samuel 17, we know this story, verse 26. Here is David, who has gone to meet his brothers who are in the battlefield according to his father's request. He takes some provision and he goes and meets them. And uh, verse 27, and the people answered David in accord with the word saying, this it will be done for the man who kills him. And the king had already, King Saul, uh, Saul had already told, whoever kills this giant, Goliath, I will give him this, that and the other, and also I will give him my daughter to be his wife. And David was curious, he went and asked, and then he went to the battle and you know the outcome of it. He defeated Goliath and he became a hero. And then we read in the New Testament in Luke chapter 2 where the angels came down from heaven and visited the shepherds in the field and they gave him the good news of the birth of Christ and after they heard it they made haste like it says um, in verse 16, chapter 2, verse 16 of Luke, and the shepherds came in haste and found their way to Mary and Joseph and the baby as he lay in the manger. So this was another kind of curiosity by which they went there and saw the baby Jesus and were blessed and they came back happily. And we read of another man, Zacchaeus. You know about his story. He was a short man, a dwarf, probably. He was not able to see Jesus in the crowd because everybody was probably much taller than him and he couldn't see Jesus. So what he thought was he went ahead of the road and he climbed up a tree and then he was waiting to see who Jesus is. And his curiosity was rewarded. And Jesus came down the tree and he looked up and said, Zacchaeus, he called him by name. Come down, I want to go home with you. And this was another man who was blessed by the Lord because of his curiosity. And there is another person we read about in John chapter 3. John chapter 3, you know, here is a man, he is a Pharisee, one of the 70, member of the Sanhedrin, called Nicodemus. He comes to Jesus one night because he didn't want anybody to see him being associated with Jesus. So he comes in the night and he talks to Jesus and Jesus speaks to him. In verse 3, he says, unless a man is born again, he cannot see God's kingdom. And this old man, he wonders, what does it mean to be born again after a person is born once? And he asked Jesus, can a person be born once more, entering into his mother's womb? And because it was, it was a good question that he asked, and because of that, Jesus 
had to explain that what it means to be born again he says in verse 5 truly truly i say to you unless one is born of water and the spirit he cannot enter into the kingdom of god and the conversation goes on and if nicodemus had not come to jesus or if he had not questioned jesus about being born again probably we didn't we wouldn't have known what it meant to be born again and probably this chapter wouldn't have been there and also john 316 which many people call mini bible that verse god so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life that verse wouldn't have been there in the bible chapter 3 wouldn't have been there in the bible if nicodemus had not gone to jesus and asked these questions these are some of the good inquisitiveness or curiosities which brought blessings to us and also we read in john 14 a couple of disciples thomas asked him lord we don't know the way and jesus said in verse 6 i am the way the truth and the life and no man comes to the father but by me and then philip asks him lord show us the father and because philip asked that jesus said i have been with you so long philip you don't know me whoever has seen me has seen the father i am in the father and the father is in me and these disciples asked questions and jesus answered them if they had not asked questions we wouldn't have known that jesus is the way the truth and the life and jesus is like the father he and the father are one and such so many glorious truths we wouldn't have known had there been no such questions arising from people but on the other hand there are also incidents in the bible number of them which were i mean people who were curious but not in the right sense they were curious to know something which was not meant for them to know for instance we read in the book of job you know the story of job he lost everything in one day i don't think in the history of humanity anybody lost everything and became a pauper overnight like job but after hearing that news three of his friends came to visit him and uh, they are eliphaz and bildad and so far they were also they were job's friends by the way probably they also must have been rich but may not be as rich as job and probably they were a little envious in themselves about the wealth and the blessing with which god had blessed them blessed him so when they heard about the adversity that befell him they came looking for job and it says they came they saw him and they couldn't recognize him because he had you know shaved his head and he had put dust on himself he was in sackcloth and all that they couldn't recognize him and was 12 and they raised their voice and wept and each of them tore his robe and they threw dust over them and their heads towards the sky and they sat down with him and it says amazing thing that for 7 days and 7 nights these three guys didn't speak one word to job what a what a tremendous thing for three people to keep their mouths shut when they have come to visit somebody and they don't open their mouth for seven days and seven nights 
and there was peace on earth and there was goodwill amongst themselves and then when they began to speak then the problem started then you know up to chapter 37 i think god never spoke and they kept on speaking and hurling accusations against job you must have done this you must have done that because of that god has brought you into this kind of thing and god was just listening as a silent listener and then we read in the last chapter of job chapter 42 god himself god himself speaks to these guys and he says in verse 11 says to them that was seven it came about after the lord had spoken these words to job that the lord said to eliphaz the temanite my wrath is kindled against you and against your two friends because you have not spoken of me what is right as my servant job has You know when you read the book of Job Job also has so many negative things to speak about God and he also accused God of certain things but his spirit was right whereas these three people who accused Job of so many things their spirit was wrong that's what Jesus the Lord says here that you have not spoken of me what is right as my servant Job has and he rebukes them and we read about daniel also daniel was such a tremendous example to all young people we read about daniel in daniel chapter 6 verse 3 in the middle he says daniel Uh, or we can read that was daniel began distinguishing himself among the com- commissioners and satraps because he possessed an extraordinary spirit and the king planned to appoint him over the entire kingdom the king wanted to exalt him next only to him and this made the other commissioners and satraps and the officials jealous of him and uh, verse 4 last part it says that they could not find anything wrong with daniel in regard to government affairs there was no accusation in his work or in his administration of the kingdom he was absolutely upright and honest they couldn't find a single fault with him he possessed an extraordinary spirit and he was faithful and no negligence or corruption was to be found in him and the only accusation that they could bring upon him was to make him fall something relating to his god and his commitment to him and they come to the king and they influence the king to pass an ordinance for 30 days nobody should pray to any god except you and i don't know maybe god was behind this and the king also passed that edict and uh, that became into a law for 30 days nobody was able to pray to any god but daniel he didn't bother about that because he knew this king will be back to the dust in a few years so my god is eternal before whom i have to stand one day so he went as usual he knelt down in his room his window shutters were open towards jerusalem he knelt down and prayed and these guys came and watched they were curious to know whether this man will obey the king or he will pray to his god and he was praying to his god and they went and uh, sneaked to the king and then they said you have to put them in lions den according to your own uh, law of the medes which cannot be revoked so daniel had to be put in the lions den 
even though the king was not happy about it and you know the story god turned the table against daniel's friends and we read in 1 samuel chapter 6 1 samuel chapter 6 verse 19 it says the ark had been captured by the philistines and they sent it back after a while and then when they sent it back in verse 19 it says it came to a place called beth shemesh and when the ark came to that place some of the curious people there in beth shemesh they looked down to see what is there inside god's ark which was none of their business and when they saw out of their curiosity it says the lord struck down some of the men of beth shemesh because they had looked into the ark of the lord he struck them down with 50070 men and that was a great slaughter this is another kind of bad curiosity and we read about another curiosity in 1 chronicles chapter 2 1 Chronicles, uh, sorry, chapter 21, verse 14. And here is another incidence where King David is tempted by Satan to take a census of his army, the strength of his army. He wanted to know how many people are there in my army. It was roughly both put together together Israel and Judah they were around 1.6 million soldiers and his commander in chief Joab he resisted he said no don't do that king may god bless you and bless you with many more um soldiers why do you want to count but king's word prevailed and um, David commanded Joab to go and take a census and they took census and god's anger got kindled against david and it says in uh, verse 14 the lord sent a pestilence because of that on israel and 70000 men fell 70000 people died there and 50000 in bachmesh because all because of curiosity and uh, when we come to the new testament i mean the bible is replete with so many incidents i don't have time i'll just um point out a few things and then i'll close it reads about we read in john chapter 21 verse 21 after peter had denied jesus and after jesus had restored him he told him to tend his sheep and then he tells him when you become old you will go to place where you don't want to go you will stretch forth your hand and people will take you where you don't want to go that is how jesus indicated as to how he was going to die and after hearing that peter became curious and he asked what about this fellow john who was 21 chapter 21 says peter therefore seeing john said to jesus lord what about this man and the interesting answer that jesus gives here is jesus said to him if i want him to remain till i come what is that to you if i want him to remain till i come what is that to you you follow me or in other words if i want him to remain till i come to be alive till my second coming what is that to you that's none of your business you mind your own business in other words that's what jesus told him and paul says to timothy in 1 timothy chapter 6 uh 1 timothy chapter 5 sorry 1 timothy chapter 5 verse 13 it speaks about certain women 
verse 13, and at the same time, they also learn to be idle and they go around from house to house and not merely idle but also gossips and busybodies talking about things not proper to, proper to mention. He's talking about certain sisters in the church who are idle, going from house to house as gossips and busybodies talking about things not proper to mention. This is a weakness the Holy Spirit always mentions in the Bible about sisters. And since the Holy Spirit mentions it, sisters, it is good for you to take it in humility and obey and live up to that. Because there's a lot of gossip, a lot of curiosity, and a lot of busybodiness in matters that don't belong to you. You see, we have young sisters in our midst. As it is, they are struggling because they're not getting proper life partners. They're seeking God for it and they're aging also. Some of the old sisters go to them and ask them, when, when are you getting married? You know, the pressure that they're going through in the home, among the relatives, friends, colleagues, neighbors, they've had enough. On top of that, when they come to meetings and they are again asked by some senior sisters, senior sisters, such questions, and it really, you know, bugs them. One of the sisters like that, she left Bangalore and went to some other place because of this kind of curious sisters. Don't add to that. Sometimes you may be, you may be asking with a good, maybe with a good burden or maybe with a good intention, but you don't know how it is going to affect the other person. And sometimes he, what is worse is when you go to, when you meet them in some weddings, you tell them you're next. Maybe you say it with a good intention, but you will have to stop that or rather you will stop it when they tell you you are next in every funeral. How will you feel about it? And as if it is not enough and those sisters get married and they get married, praise the Lord, they get a good partner and then after they get married as if it is not enough to rejoice with them, you go around, snooping around them, looking at their baby bump. Any good news, sister? What will the young sister say? She has to say, yes, sister. Then the next question is, how many months, sister? You have to say, not months, sister, 2,000 years. Yes, 2,000 years ago, Jesus died for your curiosity. Young sisters, you tell that to these nosy sisters and I'll promise you, the next two generations, they will never ask that question, even to your grandchildren. Learn to mind your own business. Sisters and brothers also. There are some brothers like sisters who go around talking things that they're not supposed to talk. They behave like women, curious about this and that and the other things. Be mindful of your own affairs. I want to close with a couple of verses. What's the remedy for this? In the old covenant, King David the psalmist said in Psalm 131, he said even though he was a king, he had every right to know what's happening in his kingdom. He said in Psalm 131, O Lord, my heart is not proud nor my eyes haughty, nor do I involve myself in great matters. 
or in things too difficult for me. See, this is the king of Israel talking. He says, I don't involve myself in great matters. Then king, who else will involve if you don't involve? He says, no, I know my limitations. And I don't want to dig into matters that are too difficult for me. I know my limitations of my intellect, my wisdom or knowledge or understanding. I can't, can't go beyond that. Surely I have composed and quieted my soul like a weaned child rests against its mother. My soul is like a weaned child within me. You've seen weaned child? When the child drinks milk and is full, it turns and so happy in the mother's arms. No care, no worry, full of joy. It's not bothered when the next meal will come. Be like that. Jesus said, unless you be converted and become like little children, you will not see the kingdom of God. And Paul also said in 1 Timothy 6.6, 6, if we have food and clothing, therewith we shall be content. Godliness with contentment is a great gain indeed. Learn to be content as you pursue after godliness. Seek to be content with what you have. And if it pleases God, God will bless you with more. And one last word in the Old Testament. Moses said in Deuteronomy 29, verse 29. It is a good verse to remember. 29, 29. It says, The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things revealed belong to us and to our sons forever, that we may observe all the words of this law. You want to obey God? You want to obey the Bible, His commandments? Then keep this verse in the forefront of your mind. The secret things belong to the Lord and things that are revealed belong to us. And anything beyond this is none of my business. Say that to yourself and be content with that. May God help us. Praise the Lord for what we have heard. <clears throat> would like to turn to Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17, a well-known verse. Verse 26 reads like this. He made from one every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined their appointed times and the boundaries and their habitation. What I see here is God chooses to draw a boundary for every person. That's, that's, uh, that's a beautiful thing that God does. Like uh, we have a compound wall around this. That's for safety. Good to, we tell children to remain within this compound wall, not to go stray outside. It's for safety, it's good. We had uh, one conference <clears throat> some time back, uh, I think in 2002 or three, about 15 years back. Uh, the conference theme was staying within our boundary and uh, finishing our course. And the brother Zach had put up a picture there a circle and uh, it's kind of a picture with colors, not colored completely inside, color going outside the boundary. And uh, Razak was explaining that uh, if a child is given to color the circle, the, it may start coloring outside and the, somebody has to guide color inside, not outside. So like that in our life also, God has drawn a circle or a boundary. We have to color inside. We have a short time left in, on this earth. We don't know when our life finishes. It's like a vapor. 
as much we focus on within that circle, then we don't lose our energy and time, like that child lo loses a lot of ink or color outside. So like that, uh, we, but we are so curious about um, boundary, outside the boundary, that is where we lose out. Like students, they're given a particular syllabus for the year. If the fifth standard student always occupied with his elder brother's um, book, seventh standard book, and always trying to look around, uh, keep referring to it and wasting a lot of time. The parents say, no, don't waste your time, stick to your subject. Something like that, there is something, a valuable lesson in that. That's what we also need to learn spiritually to focus within our boundary. That's why God has drawn a boundary. There's a reason for it. If you go outside the boundary, scripture says, the serpent will bite. So we have a flesh, in the flesh we have a lust, a strong desire to go outside. That's why God had to give a commandment saying that, do not covet. Do not covet what is not within your boundary. That's the first thing I was thinking. The second thing, being content. Being content in given circumstances, not to be too much desiring or uh, lusting after, which is not within my boundary. See, the God has put a boundary of stones in our, so to call, and we sometimes, we think, oh, I can manage. We go outside our boundary in many areas. We think, oh, I have wisdom, I have knowledge, I know more than, that that's our problem. So we try to push the stone from its boundary. It's very dangerous. It's because vengeance belongs to the Lord. See, Lord said, forgive, do not take vengeance on others. That's some, one, one kind of boundary which we should not take. The Lord, vengeance belongs to the Lord. Our glory belongs to the Lord. We are not supposed to take credit for ourselves, whatever Lord does in our life. Likewise, extending our boundary also belongs to the Lord. The Lord decides how to extend our boundaries. As long as we remain within our boundary, we have safety and we should not think highly about ourselves and trying to cross then serpent uh, bites. And the third thing, <clears throat> how to remain within my, my boundary? And that is being under authority. That's what I see. If I read in Romans 12, 3, which says, be honest in your estimate of yourself, measuring your value by how much faith God has given you. That means, many, most of the times, we think, I know, I know more than what I know. We have a higher estimation of ourselves. When I am under authority, see, it's like children. Children think that I can do this, but parents say, no, don't do that. Like they try to play, try to do what mother does with the knife. Parents say, no, you cannot do that. See, like that, we think we can do something which uh, we should not do. But being under authority, whether at home, in school, or in the church, it will protect us, give us light. That's how I have uh, seen in my own life. And being under authority, I got light on myself that I don't have grace for certain things. I don't have faith for certain things. That's very important. That's how we grow. That's how we learn how to color within the circle. And the fourth thing, being in the kingdom of God, that is, as Romans 14, 17 says, righteousness, peace, and joy. Always to do right with peace and joy. Always uh, to check ourselves whether I have peace and joy so that Lord's blessing can come upon my life. I have to check. If I don't have peace about certain things, I have to go to the Lord and say, Lord, I think I'm doing right, but I don't have peace and joy. Help me. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Teach me how to remain within my boundary. Like Jude 21 says, stay always within the boundaries where God's love can reach and bless you. How do I um, conform myself? If I don't have peace in my heart, joy in my heart, even though I think I'm doing right, 
something is wrong so that I, I should recognize my boundary and God's love will come and reach and bless me. And as we heard last word, last one, fifth one, the blessing of being weak. As we heard, it's a beautiful psalm, Psalm 131. Being like a weaned child, O Lord, my heart is not proud, nor my eyes haughty, nor do I involve myself in great matters or in things too difficult for me. Surely I have composed and quieted, quieted my soul like a weaned child dressed against his mother. My soul is like a lean child, wean child within me. What it shows is, like Jesus, Jesus always remained within his boundary. That was a blessing and also a protection for him. We all need to learn. We don't have to think we have that. I, I myself, I need to learn to stay within my boundary so that God's love can reach and bless me so that I can be a blessing to others. And it, we leave it to God to uh, extend my boundaries. It's God's duty, God's work. As he extends, he gives us grace and peace and joy follows me. I would like to remain in that.